SpaceX was able to launch Starship and it made it off the launch pad and incredibly successful today, day today. We have, of course, with us the Rain Man David Sachs, the Sultan of Science David Friedberg, and of course the dictator Chamath Palihapitiya. But two special guests are here. Special guests. Gavin yes. Baker from Atreides. How do you pronounce it? Atreides. Atreides. House Atreides. House Atreides, if you know Dune. And then SpaceX board member. Antonio Gracias, one of the first investors in SpaceX. Antonio, a big day for you. Maybe you could just tell the audience what happened today, why that is so important in the history of this company. Well, first, I want to thank you guys for letting me uh, come on and have a little chat with you about this. Today was extraordinarily important for, for SpaceX, I think, for America and for humanity. And the Starship is the realization of a uh, the vision had Elon had 20 years ago, 25 years ago, even as a child, really, to, to go to Mars. And the engineers here at, at SpaceX and all the entire team working extremely hard, or really just to get this, this uh, vehicle off the pad, as, as Elon has said, right? The, the, this is a brand new vehicle. Everything about it is new. So the engines, the material science, the structure, the design, all of it new. And the most important thing here was to get off the pad so we could collect data. And this technology platform is the platform that will allow us to go to Mars. So from a non-engineer standpoint, why this is important is that what we've proven with this flight, we got past a um, point called max Q, which is the point at which the vehicle takes maximum stress. That's how I think about it. I'm sure engineers will tell you a lot more a description to it, or David Friedberg will give you a better description to it. But it's the most amount of stress in the vehicle, which means that this vehicle will get to orbit. And this is the vehicle that's going to take us to Mars. So today is the day that all of the hardworking people at SpaceX accomplished a goal of making the human race spacefaring. When we look back in history, I believe this will be the day when we mark the, the technological development that we broke through and built a vehicle that could actually go to Mars. Now, when we look at it, uh, obviously, it didn't make it to orbit. Maybe you can give some context into what is the typical life cycle of a new rocket ship coming out. The Falcon, the original one, has done, I think, 224 missions, 222 of them successful. I think 160 or so actually landed themselves. Yes. yes. And so you had two or three mulligans, I think, in the development of that, maybe two, actually. So what can we expect here? When are they going to stack and rack and launch the next one? Antonio, let's see. What's the timeline here? To getting to orbit what, what, what would we expect versus some of the other projects that we've seen like the russian rockets so look this is um a brand new vehicle and whenever we develop a brand new vehicle it takes a long time development you know my understanding all this is uh, as, as again a layman and sort of as a, a board member not an executive here is that it'll take at least call it you know, two or three months two or three months to really get the pad rebuilt and get another vehicle back on for testing uh maybe longer but it's really important to note here that We've gotten sort of used to the idea that SpaceX launches rockets and all these rockets come back and all those vehicles are stable because the Falcon 9 and 9 Heavy are so stable and they're so well engineered and they're amazing vehicles, the most reliable vehicles on Earth in human history. This is a brand new vehicle. This was a huge win. I mean, it was an enormous win for the company, mm -hmm. an enormous win for the country, just getting it off the pad and collecting the data. And now we know it works. We just have to get it stable now and get up to orbit. So it's, it's really, it's, it's a hard problem, but it's a solvable problem from here. And the, the we learned here is that this vehicle does work. Amazing. Can you guys talk about like the impact of this vehicle, cost to launch, payload, like the big metrics that are that kind of help realize that outcome? Gavin, I think I saw you did a bunch of really good tweets on this. You shared some of the metrics that, that, I, that, that I thought were really succinct and really helpful. Yeah, sure. So when this is, I think it's a long road to full reusability. Um, you know, the first step will be Mechazilla catching the booster. Doesn't, it doesn't have uh, legs like the Falcon 9. And then the second step will be landing the Starship, which is really hard. But once you do that, they should be able to send over 100 metric tons to orbit at a variable cost of under $2 million per public data. This, these are... Public statements. I would never confirm or deny those statements. But this, is, again, this, is Gavin's, this is Gavin's math off the, off the back of the envelope. Two million dollars is the cost to get a hundred tons into orbit. That's that's the the metric. Variable cost. Variable cost. So, right. but I, I think the point Gavin's making, if if I might just please add, is that it is a step function change. 
It's not like a small change. It's an enormous change. Right. Can you compare that to the numbers before for folks to understand? The Falcon 9 mass to useful orbit is 17 metric tons. And the variable cost that, you know, I, I have seen Elon tweet about is somewhere around $15 million. So you are lifting more than five times the mass to orbit. And based on other statements, that 100 metric tons is a very conservative estimate. And you are doing it, I'd call it 10 to 15% of the cost. So this is a, you know, we can all do the math, but let, we can envelope it, um, you know, roughly a 50x Huge. change. And this, yeah. you know, massively changes unit economics for Starlink, for sending anything into orbit. And as Antonio said, it's, it's great for SpaceX, it's great for America, and it's great for, uh, for everyone it's on It's great Earth. for humanity, yeah. It's great for humanity. Can you explain how that then translates into going to Mars? So now we can get 100 tons into orbit for $2 million. What happens next in terms of like how that payload capacity and low cost enables you know, full transport to Mars? And you know, I know that the timelines are tough, but it would be super helpful to just to translate the, the orbit concept into the let's go to Mars concept. It's important to know that like the size of this thing, to give a sense of scale, is the interior um, space of it is the size of the International Space Station. So it's a huge amount of, of tonnage. Just think about all that it's going to take to get to Mars, right? You've got to, you'd have to lift... A payload into orbit. You have to, you know, create a base either on the moon or 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 in um, it's orbiting the Earth to actually refuel ships and send them out into space. And this same design will scale up to become the Mars Colonial Transporter, very similar design. That's why it's important. And look, the timeline on that, I don't know. I'm hoping that it will be um, while well, I am still able to go. That would be great, physically able to go. But that's really why it's important. Think of this as a small version of the same vehicle we will actually use to go to Mars. And then all the stuff you have to transport to orbit becomes more, more economic because as Gavin just said, we've had you know, a 50X kind of reduction in cost. Can I ask you another question? Sorry, I'm, I don't mean to monopolize the questions, but these are things that I think are like super important questions, but that, that a lot of people often ask, or I hear them asking, but what happens with the space industry in the nearer term. So there's this great long-term goal, get to Mars. That's a, that's a big project. There'll certainly be funding, I'm sure, to run that project. But what other economies now emerge as this, this cost down of 50X happens? And what else do you think happens besides you know, communications and Starlink? Obviously, there's, that's already a pretty scale business. What other markets can develop here in the near term? What other economies do you see happening as a result of this cost down? Yeah, I mean, look, Gavin could jump in here too, but the, the reality is once you can take that much mass to orbit, you can move anything around the planet very quickly. You can kind of go up, let the Earth spin below you and come down. So transportation generally changes. You know, if you want to fly to, to Tokyo from New York City, it goes from being, you know, a day trip to a matter of hours. It's extraordinary. Or a container ship in a couple hours. kind of thing. Yeah, everything that's rapid transport around the Earth, you right. run packages around the Earth, everything gets faster. Gavin? Yeah, there will be no more trans-Pacific or transatlantic cargo flights. I think in five, six, seven, eight, ten years, you're going to need yeah. a big starship fleet yeah. to accomplish that. But I think the um, transatlantic and trans-Pacific aerospace cargo routes go away. So transportation logistics, I think, is a fundamental a change. Human transport, fundamental change. Um, and then there's all the knock-on effects of building this kind of technology. Look, the space program, the American space program that took us to the moon, created the cell phones we use, right? I mean, there's so much, this ch chip designs, all the technology that came off of that, the same kind of effects we believe will happen here. So it's hard to predict, but it will be a lot of great stuff. 